today we are going to look at the three cantos uh, in the eighth sphere of uh, Dante's cosmos. We are beyond the planets, beyond the, all this so-called eighth sphere, or the heaven of the fixed stars. Before we get to, which will be next week, next time, the Empyrean, uh, the, 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 the heaven of, uh, of light and fire. Um, and, but now we are in the, in the heaven of the fixed stars, and Dante discusses the three theological virtues. Uh, and the three theological virtues, unlike the so-called to distinguish them from the cardinal virtues uh, that Christians share with the classical tradition, namely, uh, you know, the, the fortitude, uh, prudence, etc., justice, uh, etc. The, these are the virtues that deal with uh, uh, the, understanding that the understanding of the divine. They open up this uh, horizon of uh, speculations about, um, about the language of God, the, God, the way God speaks to us, theology in this sense, the way in which we speak about God, theology, the logos. In theology, there's the word logos and uh, the way God speaks to us. So it's, it's, uh, it's the place of, uh, in paradise where Dante will focus on the meaning of what, what I call, it's not my phrase, basic words. Uh, the words which are foundations of uh, the way in which we come out to discover who we are. The words that we use, the words that we may not even know exactly what they mean, and yet Dante will try to uh, define them. They are, I repeat, uh, faith, hope, and charity. Um, the three virtues uh, that Dante will, uh, in this, using uh, Paul's letter to the Hebrews, where he accounts or gives the definitions at least of faith and hope, but they are words that, they are terms that always implicate each other. You cannot go on explaining faith without really talking about hope. You cannot go on talking about hope without explaining faith. And both of them are recapitulated and come together, gather within the question of, uh, within the virtue of charity and the virtue of love, uh, or virtue of love. They are words that, in, they are very mysterious in many ways, but they are, but there are degrees of understanding, all of them. Um, the three uh, examiners, because Dante will go through uh, the equivalent of a university examination, a medieval bachelor's degree, that's the term comes to us from universities, medieval universities, the bachelor. Dante is a bachelor who presents himself to the teacher. The teacher is testing him uh, and uh, he will, uh, uh, who give an answer according to textbooks. Authentic, where the authentic, uh, um, the deposit of uh, one's own beliefs, one's own hopes, and one's own charity um, are gathered. The three teachers are going to be three apostles who are, with, uh, with, who are known as uh, uh, Peter for faith, St. Peter for faith, and that makes sense. It was Peter himself, the name stands for the uh, the cornerstone on which the edifice of Christian belief uh, is built. The second one is going to be for the virtue of hope is going to be James, known also as the, the Galician, uh, because why him? Uh, it would seem to be less obvious than the other two because he among of all the apostles is the one whose death was recorded in, uh, in the Acts uh, of the Apostles, and so he lived in a certain expectation of a life to come. So he would seem to be the real figure of uh, hopefulness, of uh, some idea, of uh, some way of uh, uh, expecting uh, uh, a future, a future and it, it, the life of eternity. The virtue of uh, charity instead is, uh, uh, um, is, is, is uh, examined uh, uh, by John, the apostle, to distinguish him from uh, the, the, uh, the seer, uh, the writer of the apocalypse. So it's the three apostles, uh, Peter, James, and, uh, and John.
And are these are there ways in which we could, uh, um, I, I could give some summary ways of uh, uh, trying to understand uh, some of these virtues. Uh, uh, one thing that I would ask you to look through when you have uh, time to go in, in uh, detail of this, of this text, it seems to me that all the three cantos deal or have as a kind of uh, uh, what I would call undertext. Uh, the um, sub, uh, subtext of them, something that uh, running through, uh, but um, sometimes even uh, visible, but not all the time visible, is the question of exile. Dante is retrieving the language of exile, the langu as if these virtues are clearly virtues that don't, don't concern at all the blessed in heaven, they can only concern us here in time. The, he the, the blessed in heaven certainly do not need a faith, or hope, or they don't, want, they, they don't really need to know about what love may be. Either they have it, or they wouldn't be there, right? So this is, uh, but it's uh, the language of uh, exile is running through uh, these three issues, just as the language of time. Uh, so the connection between time and exile probably needs not uh, much explanation, much glossing. Uh, we are in time, we are fallen, and it's only in the language of, uh, of the fall that it's possible to think about, uh, about exile. The other, the other um, uh, element running through this is really the question of uh, very visible, a little, uh, especially in Canto 26, the actual question of, uh, of language itself. You know, what is the language of God? Um, what are the names of God? Dante asks is that question. Do, are we talking about uh, an entity with a name? And if so, you know the whole debate about the so-called uh, tetragrammaton, the four letters uh, that are supposedly uh, the tetragrammaton, that name God. That's what the, the word means, the four letters. Uh, are, they, are they known? Or is God just ineffable? Is there some... Is, 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 is it some kind of reality we can never even hope to, may, to name? Or are we going to be related and connected to this idea, this knowledge of God, by analogical discourse? These are positions, uh, the mystical position that denies even the, the, our knowledge of the name of God, uh, the analogical position put forth by Aquinas, for instance, that we really talk about God analogically and all the qualities we attribute to God, uh, only they're not real in, but by what we may know in our own lives. So Dante asks this question about what is the language of God? What are the names of God and how do we get, get to know God? So the first, um, the first virtue then is the virtue of faith. There are many ways, literally it's a, I call it a basic word because it's really a basic word because it founds us. Uh, uh, it's a stone. Peter asks for the foundation of uh, all this poetic edifice of uh, the, divine, the divine comedy. I would like you to uh, think about this, uh, the actual, st let me get into the text, uh, there is this, uh, this, this actual apostrophe, um, or at the beginning of Canto 24, of fellowship elect to the great supper of the blessed Lamb who feeds you so that your desire is ever satisfied, since by God's grace this man has foretaste of that which falls from your table before death appoints his time, give heed to his measureless craving and bedew him with some drops. You drink always from the fountain whence it comes and that on which his mind is set. He wants to know about that. What I do, what I would like to stress is the presence of this actual metaphor of a banquet. Uh, it is as if Dante is uh, clearly we're dealing with uh, two metaphors here. One, which is exilic, the manna in uh, the desert, the falling of this dew on, uh, on, on the exiles, uh, the wanderers, uh, the Jewish wanderers in the desert. And the other one is the, the eschatological banquet. But it is, as, it is a, 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 as if any debate about faith has to be placed within a communal context. This is not going to be uh, the profession of faith the way you may have it, let's say, in 1550, roughly. No? Uh, the, and I'm really alluding to, as a contrast, as a contrast, um, just to make you understand the case, uh, uh, the great debate between two figures of the Renaissance called Erasmus and Luther. They debated at length about the question of whether or not 
uh, how a text of uh, written about a century earlier, around 1440, a text by uh, Valla, uh, a great uh, humanist uh, who wrote about the free will and the defense of the free will, on free will, he, they, they were, it was unclear to them what Valla really meant. So they go on debating, in Texas called on free will. Uh, Erasmus maintains that Valla really had defended the existence of free will, because it's free will, which is a gift of God. Uh, it's it's uh, something that has been given to us, and, um, uh, um, and therefore we really have to come to know God through uh, the acknowledgement of his authority, but uh, because the freedom that we are talking, that he's talking about, he thinks Valle is talking about, actually comes from him. And so by the free will, we come to know and come to choose also the existence of divinity. Luther had uh, very radical ideas about the question of, uh, of, uh, of freedom. Um, uh, there was no such a thing, he would argue, as uh, free will. Um, and actually the world, the universe, is a universe of absolute faith. And faith is freedom and it's given to us by freedom because it releases us from all obligations, it frees us from all constraints, it just makes us uh, uh, understand that our own relationship to the Creator is uh, uh, without any other intermediary forces of the world. So it's, it's a radical theological claim of freedom and faith together. It's very possible, many people, just to give you, a, to extend this argument, there are many uh, poets and thinkers who go on changing this scenario and believe that, for instance, freedom is actually the source of uh, uh, not faith, but faithlessness that the idea of faith, one's own uh, faithlessness may come, a denial of God may come from the assertion of oneself and the assertion of one's own total freedom. But this is, I'm giving you this also to exemplify the, the nature of the debates and the force of the debates. Dante insists, so removes the question of uh, faith from one of radical subjectivity or radical faith, uh, aware that there may be some kind, some, some uh, uh, flip side to it, the, that, that faith and lack of faith really both depend. If you reduce them to subjectivity, uh, one can go on sliding into uh, one of the two options very easily. Dante focuses on, with this first image, on the question of the communal experience, the banquet. And that to me is part of the shared world. Uh, this, this eschatological banquet where they're all, the vision where at the end of time, uh, but uh, the allusion is also to the mana uh, where, where, where uh, this, this, the various figures, uh, com com the community comes together. And then Dante goes on uh, really focusing on the individuality, on the private professional faith. It's really about him. The interesting thing that I want to point out is that Beat Beatrice's words to Peter around lines 30, she, she goes on up uh, appealing to him to go on to uh, examining, but she does so in a very peculiar way. Let me read this passage. And she, lines 32, O eternal light of the great soul with whom our Lord left the keys. There's no, this is very canonical. It's part of the hagiography, the, the account of uh, uh, the iconographic representation of Peter with the two keys, which he brought down all of this wondrous joy. Test this man on points, light and grave, as thou seest good regarding the faith by which thou walkest on the sea. This is an allusion recorded in the gospel of Peter walking out of an act of faith, walking on water. Because Jesus asks him and tells him so. The, the strange thing about this reference is that Peter did not want to walk on water. It is the moment of, the, let me call it the crisis of faith, the moment where Peter had no faith. And in fact, Jesus calls him, oh man of little faith, why don't you walk? And then he, uh, I guess, feeling that he's teetering on the, on the brink of the abyss. You can imagine, uh, really, see sowing over the waves finally does manage to go on. This is a, 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 a poignant moment because clearly Dante is emphasizing that 
there are degrees of faith and that the so-called crisis of faith uh, must not be seen as denials of faith, on the contrary. That somehow there is a, a sort of dialectical movement between a profession of faith and doubts about owning and, 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 and that's the, the, the uh, owning this, uh, this gift, having this gift of faith. So this is uh, one of the strange moments and it's in the light of this uh, strange fluctuation between faith and an experience of not faith that I think that the, uh, what happens later uh, has to, uh, the way it has to be, to be understood. And then whether he loves rightly and rightly hopes and believes, here are the three the language of the three theological virtues all come together. It's not hid from thee since thou seest them and so on. And then Dante uses both the, uh, the language of the university uh, life, academic life as if this were really uh, an academic test. We'll come back to this issue in a moment. Uh, just as the bachelor, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the bachelor of arts, the baccalaureatus as we call it, arms himself. So there are two. There is the weapon of knowledge, the academic knowledge as a force, knowledge as a weapon. Just as the bachelor arms himself and does not speak till the master, uh, magister, submits the question for argument, not for settlement. Huh? In other words, the quest, these issues are issues that always need the open-endedness of argumentation and not that of a settling. Of, uh, of the point, I armed myself with all my reasons while she was speaking to be ready for such a questioning and for such a profession. Speak, good Christian, declare thyself. Now, this is the, a knowledge that makes, him, that, that makes him visible, declare thyself, but a knowledge that does not keep him hidden, it sort of brings him into, into existence, makes him visible to us. Where is faith? And that's the question. Uh, that he, that Peter asks, and the answer is, may the grace which, uh, which grants it to me to make my confession to the chief centurion, I began giving me right utterance from my thoughts. And I went on as the truthful pen, an allusion is to Paul, a questioning a, a, an authority, and the, the word authority, as you know, is that which is, when, what do we mean by authentic? And authority is a key, key word. The word is auctoritas. I uh, mean, that comes, which is worthy of faith. Um, the teacher is not necessarily worthy of faith. You can question the opinions of the teacher and reject the question of the, there's a distinction between the master and the author, uh, the one or the authority, the one who is an author is one who is worthy of belief, worthy of faith. So he quotes Paul, so this is a canonical answer, it's the truthful pen of the dear brother Paul, wrote of it with thee father put Rome on the good path, faith is the substance, uh, literally the foundation, that which lies under all things, the, the ground of all things, substance of things hoped for. So faith, you know, if we want to understand faith, we ought to probably go and read about hope, things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. And this I take to be its quiddity. Quiddity, a medieval, a medieval part of the medieval lexicon meaning its constitutive uh, uh, essence, its, uh, its specificity. Now, if you thought that um, uh, in the Middle Ages they would go on talking about faith, the famous formulation of faith comes from Tertullian who says, I believe because it is absurd. So that faith becomes uh, the consequence of, the extension of, the absurdity of all things. And, and because the claim made on what one believes has in itself the idea of uh, going being beyond reason, absurd in that sense, being beyond reason. Uh, um, and that's one of the ways in which faith is defined. It really means that faith exceeds the realm of reason. It means that faith can never really quite be an object of knowledge. Dante does not pursue that line. He tries to make faith and reason coextensive. This is the sense of the, I gotta qualify that term coextensive and I will in a moment. Uh, 
particles. Obviously, they are not, uh, but they, are, they, they belong together. This is the sense of the whole metaphorical pattern of the university context. That's to say, you can know something about belief. Knowledge and faith really uh, belong to that. They implicate each other. They are not the same thing, because if you really could uh, know everything of what you believe, then there is no reason why you should believe. Uh, that which faith becomes necess a necessity only because they are, it's a way of acknowledging limitations of what one knows. But linking knowledge and faith is not just simply a way of saying that reason can know some of the uh, content of what one believes, that there is a reasonableness to what one believes. That's all true to say that reason and faith go together. There are certain claims about the reasonableness of what one believes. It's, it, but it, it really means, I think, at a deeper level, that faith itself is a mode of knowledge. That it is a mode of knowledge exactly the way you have the knowledge of philosophy, though its modalities are going to be different, because philosophy uh, submits to the rules of uh, the rationality. But faith opens your eyes, and it's a way of showing you something about the world that the reason alone cannot do. So the binding of the two metaphors, that's what I meant, coextensive, but not identical. I didn't mean it identical. The joining of philosophy and theology, reason and faith, makes and projects faith as a way of knowing. Uh, it, it, it makes you see the world in uh, different ways if, than uh, if you were trying to look at the world in the, in the, in the light of natural reason and from, and from uh, the point of view of rationality. So this is, seems to be, to be the argument. And I, I set the terms uh, against, let's say, a modern uh, subjective idea of freedom, free, freedom, a faith as freedom that frees you from all, and you are only um, accountable to the creator, uh, or, free, or, or faith as a mode uh, of responding to the absurdity around oneself, which is really the language of uh, uh, Tertullian, and then this scholastic argument that, that uh, Aquinas of knowledge and faith uh, really needing uh, to, be, uh, to be together. And then the examination goes on, and I want to talk about 70. Uh, then here, thou thinkest right, uh, this is the beginning of uh, the top of the page, Cantor 24, line 68. Then I heard, thou thinkest rightly, if thou understandest well what he placed it among the substances and after, uh, and after among the evidences. And then, uh, and I then, the deep things which so richly manifest themselves to me here are so hidden from men's eyes below that their existence lies in belief alone. Now, it's a distinction, the cesura between belief and what we are, the evidence of things not seen. The paradox remains. So there are things visible here in uh, the heaven of the, uh, the, the fixed stars uh, and not available to those of us who are in time and uh, in, uh, in the fallen world, on which is based the lofty hope, and therefore it takes the character of substance. And from this belief, we must reason without seeing more. Therefore, it holds the character of evidence. This is a gloss on the medieval philo theological uh, lexicon that Dante has been deploying. Then I heard, if all that is acquired below for doctrine were thus understood, there would be no room left for sophist wit. And then, this breathed from the kindled kind of love, and it continued. I want you to pay attention to this metaphor. I wish we had, we were really sitting around the table where I could ask you to speculate about the presence of the coming metaphor. If all that is acquired below for doctrine, um, I'm sorry, now the alloy and the weight of this money have been well examined but tell me if thou hast it in thy purse. All of a sudden, the question of money and the question of faith come together. Faith is literally given as said, it's said to be um, money. Uh, do you have this, this, this coin 
in, in your purse. I therefore, I have indeed so bright and round that it's m of its mintered, I am in no doubt. Then there came from the depth of the light that was shining there, this precious jewel. That's one reason why the metaphor of money is used for, clearly, for faith. It's a precious jewel on which every virtue rests. Whence did it come to thee? And the language is going to be, it's from the plenteous reign of the Holy Spirit and the new parchments and so on. But that metaphor of uh, money as faith uh, really sort of has a way of lingering on in our minds. What, what, what is the connection? One connection, I repeat, is to indicate the preciousness of uh, the faith one holds. Uh, it, is, it is really as rare, maybe, and it's, and it's valuable as rare, uh, beautiful jewels can be. That's, that's one thing. Um, but clearly there is more. Because the word money, which Dante uses in Italian, moneta, it's the same word, uh, it becomes a character in an English epic. Moneta comes from the Latin form uh, uh, moneo, the word money, as you know, comes from, uh, 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 it's like uh, meaning a, a warning. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's an advice, it's a warning. Uh, a warning about its, uh, its mintage, it's, 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 it's part of the language of, uh, of uh, we have the word admonishment that comes from it, it admonishes that it's not a counterfeit, that it is really pure, okay, so that's another way of uh, referring to the purity of this faith, the preciousness before, now the purity of this faith, uh, the authenticity of it, so to speak. Uh, another trait of money is that money has, it's that which establishes the value, it circulates, first of all, has the power of circulating, um, that's not said by the text, but it's implied by the metaphor. It is as if, as if, it is as if uh, faith has that power, is that virtue that puts everything into motion, and therefore questions and establishes. That's what makes it a basic word. It establishes, it's the substance that establishes the values of all the things that are uh, around us. But fourth, I cannot really get past my mind that Dante wants us to think about this kind of the resonance of profanation that is in the language of money and link it with really this purity of faith. It is as if there is the distinction is really ne never quite between profanation and the purity of faith and that somehow the world of faith comes out of the world of profanation that it belongs to the world of time, it can be profaned, and yet it still manages to put things into circulation. You see, the, the ambiguity of money, the ambiguity of the metaphor of money, I think uh, sheds a lot of light on this virtue that Dante uh, has been um, uh, examining. Uh, he's been examined about it, but he has been he's examining it for us. Uh, let me go and see how, whether we can see more about this virtue by looking at the question of hope that comes uh, uh, immediately after with the examination by St. James. I begin to tell you here just a little uh, story that, uh, oh, it's not an unusual story, but as you probably know, uh, the Greeks never thought of hope as a virtue. Um, uh, the, the uh, there is a reference to hope in uh, uh, as being one of Pandora's, being all one of the um, the the uh, the entities available in Pandora's box. You know about Pandora's box, which was opened, and all the evils of the world came out of Pandora's box, save for one, hope. It's a statement. It's a view. That always that really casts hope as clearly some kind of evil or a delusion, and in fact, for the Greeks, the idea of hope is always a a, a term that implies the delusion of exile. It's really what befalls an exile, someone who loses one's 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 land, and what is left for him to do? Nothing but 
hope. It's the radical illusion. It's a kind of hope against hope. I, I have nothing more to do. It's a self-deception. That's really what it is. Dante does not follow that route for hope. And in effect, I think that he finds in the Bible the idea that, or, or, or a kind of a new, a different horizon, a, a kind for the, the rethinking uh, the way in which hope uh, uh, can be viewed. Hope, first of all, is literally a virtue of time. More so, faith, uh, it, it with the language of the clock, you must have noticed uh, in Canto 24, introducing uh, uh, the world of hope. I, I, I did not want to uh, talk about it because I know that I'll be talking about it now. Hope is as much a faith, a virtue of time. Uh, because it's a virtue not only of time, it's a virtue specifically of the future. It tells me, whenever, if I have hope, I can't really hope about the past. It would be, it would fly. Uh, in, uh, against all sense, against all logic. I hope yesterday didn't rain. Doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, it, but I can hope that tomorrow won't snow. I can, I can have that hope, which would be a silly hope, but it's a hope nonetheless, because it's a virtue of time in the future. It's a way of experiencing time in the future. That's one thing that Nantes is doing. Uh, linking, therefore, hope and temporality. But it's not only a virtue of time, it's the most realistic of virtues. Because normally we think, and the Greeks would sort of give us a cause to pause, that if you really hope, it's because you are really desperate. You, know, it's, you, you hope because they have no rational uh, reason, no realistic reason to believe that things are going to go the way you wish they went for you. So you go on hoping. Dante says, no, hope is the most realistic of virtues because it tells me that nothing is really ever over. That's what makes it realistic. The, the negation of hope, the opposite of hope, would be despair. That you, Dante, you remember, is the sin for Dante, is the sin that we find uh, in Canto, we never read it, and now, retrospectively, I can tell you that you should go and read it, Canto 8 of, of Inferno. And even in Canto 9, the encounter with the Medusa is a, that fear of despair, that idea of being petrified. Uh, the Medusa can turn you into a stone. That is to say that you are imprisoned and you remain caught either in your standpoint or in that particular reality that you have, or the idea of yourself as, as, as you like to, as you think you have been, in the idea of the past. Dante says, no, hope is a virtue of the future. It's a virtue that can even change the past. In that sense, it's effective on the past, though it's deterrent, because it tells us that the past may not be what we thought it was. You know, whatever disaster you may have had, whatever disappointment you may have had in the past, that disappointment may contain seeds that really will reappear in the future and maybe are preparing a future that will surprise you. So this is a, a, a different understanding of time that Dante uh, presents. It's an understanding of time that once again Dante uh, uh, links with two moments of his, which is, uh, in that sense, it's really not different from faith. It fulfills faith. It unveils the element of faith. You cannot really go on hoping about something like that unless you have some, an act of faith. Uh, um, and, 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 and Dante goes on explaining it in existential terms and, and tying it to his own hope of returning to his homeland, his own native city, and the larger pattern of exile. I want to examine that with you. The poem begins with, uh, uh, with a subjunctive. The Canto 25 begins with an optative, what we call, uh, I wish, you know, oh, that things were going that way. Uh, if, if, if ever, if ever come to pass. Contingency, the word is contingency in Italian. It uses a Latinism, because uh, we don't really use that in that sense. But uh, uh, um, I read an Italian, even if Margaret, ah, I wish she were here. Uh, Se mai continga. That's a Latinism. If ever it were to come, if, if ever were contingent, if ever happened in that sense, that the sacred poem, quel poema is sacro. If ever come to pass the sacred poem, I'm going to use a sacred, and the sacred means 
But remember that Dante uses the word sacred in always in a double sense. A sacred, he's not investing it with uh, some kind of uh, magic, idolatrous power, because for Dante, the sacred is never reducible or localizable. That's a verb, a verb localizable in one object or in one particular place. Uh, he means it ambiguously as that which contains the profane and the sacred within it, hell and heaven, descriptions of heaven and hell. The sacred poem to which both heaven and earth have set their hands. It's an incredible moment of prophetic self-awareness. I am writing, but I know that without God, I would not be able to be writing this poem, that it has made me lean for many years writing now. I'm sorry that I'm giving you this kind of uh, simple um, uh, uh, paraphrase of it, but the ascesis of writing. Writing as a, pro you understand what I mean? Writing as an ascetic labor of the soul. It makes, it makes me lean as if uh, he were un undergoing fasting. The rituals, the rituals of, uh, of, of the, the, the commitment to a particular labor, so I call it the, the ascetic labor of, uh, of the soul, uh, uh, should overcome the cruelty that bars me from the fair sheepfold. Uh, so if, if I could ever go back home. But he called back home Florence in the Cant of Hope, the Cant of Hope, where he's an exile, uh, and the city is described in pastoral terms. Uh, the metaphor of the city as a sheepfold, the pastoral language, the language you expect to have in the eclogues of Virgil, the pastoral tradition, uh, the idyllic world. That's what we mean, the pastoral tradition. Anyway, if there ever were some peace, some idyllic, uh, idyllic uh, uh, circumstances in that city, and you can continue, um, where I slept as a lamb. Here he continues with the pastoral language. An enemy to the wolves that make war on it with another voice now, and other fleas. I shall return a poet, and the font of my baptism take the laurel crown. For there I entered into the faith that makes soul known to God, and after, because of it, Peter does encircle my brow. So Dante is still is in the, in, the, in the circle of hope, in the heaven of hope, and yet now he's really thinking about the last ceremony of Peter on him, who, who blesses him three times. As if, as, it is as if literally faith and hope are now converging. The two, the two virtues come together. What is Dante saying, though, here in this cant, in this proem, at the beginning of this canto? He's casting his hometown, Florence, in the pastoral language, as a sheepfold. And then, oh, he's alluding to a messianic time where, when, if it were just, when the peace were restored, when the factions, the wolves, the wolves, you know, the pun of wolves and wolves, it's very clear. That's what etymologically the word wolves come from, from wolves, and the lambs will lie together. Almost a kind of impossible time, a messianic time, when finally peace would be restored. And he goes on adding that he would be acknowledged, that's part of his hope, he would be acknowledged, uh, there will be, a, at that time, he would be acknowledged as a poet on the fount of his baptism, which as you know, it refers to the baptistry of St. John, where we do have records that he actually was christened. That's simple language, but you have to ask yourselves, why? would Dante talk? Why would he use this particular metaphor? The baptism is clearly the place where a community is constituted, and the baptismal font has that, that value. Not only has that value, it's actually the same baptismal font, font that Dante had, you remember, there had been a profanation of it in Canto, described in Canto 19 of hell, where Dante says that he broke one of those, uh, those, those wells there, one of those uh, wells, exactly, uh, which we try to understand in figurative terms, since it would be inconceivable that Dante would be capable of breaking it, he says to him, to rescue someone who was dying. But the, what is a baptismal font? For those of you who have no uh, inkling of what this is, it's, it's the, what we call the sacramental, the typological, if you really are more uh, textual and historical about, about that uh, sacrament, that, that, that ceremony, reenactment of Exodus. When a child is baptized, he is literally said, 
is told, actually, that he is once again reenacting the crossing of Exodus. And to me, this is extraordinary. That Dante says that he would be now acknowledged and be given the laurel uh, of the poet on the baptismal font. The question you have to ask yourselves is, no doubt, is Dante is asking, how does a poet come home? He imagines a triumph at the baptismal font. Is there a home? What is the homecoming of poets? That, that's the hope. A hope for a homecoming where everybody will be at peace and there will be a feast, a festive mood, and he is going to be welcomed back and he'll be hailed and acknowledged as a poet. A great fantasy of every of the winners return. That's literally what he's saying. Yet he's using this language of the baptismal font, which is the language of Exodus. It is as if he were saying that the poet can only come home in order to tell his community that I have to get out again. That all of them will have to do exactly what's happening to him. That the exile that has been, for which he, with which he has been punished and which has befallen him is really the message that his poetry can only give to the community from which he has been exiled. He's, he's convoking the whole community around the baptismal font, which is the figure of exile, to tell them this is really where we belong, in, the, in exile, in the language of a spiritual exile, a language in which clearly, which clearly implies some kind of uh, uh, re, um, remaking of oneself, rethinking of oneself. So now with this in mind, Dante goes on seeing the baron for whom below they visit Galicia, an allusion to Santiago, and then she herself will go on. And I want to, uh, before we read the, 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 the passage, I want to uh, give you this, uh, the compassionate one, line 50, the Beatrice's presentation of Dante to St. James, and that compassionate one who directed the feathers of my wings. Huh? Light of the soul, the name of the family, Ali, Yeri, uh, to so, so, so high a flight anticipated my reply. The church militant, this is Beatrice, has not a child more full of hope as is written in the sun that irradiates all our host. Therefore, is it granted him to come from Egypt to Jerusalem that he may see it before his warfare is accomplished. The other two points about which thou didst ask, not for enlightenment for him to report how dear this virtue is to thee, I leave to my himself, for they will not be hard for him, nor occasion for boasting. Uh, and then like a pupil once again taking this language of, uh, of school, the school child. The main thing about this, self, uh, this presentation by Beatrice is that Dante's journey is glossed through one figure one figure that I have been telling you ever since we started this, this, this course, these classes uh, in September, through the figure of Exodus. Dante's journey here is literally described as a journey from Egypt to Jerusalem, which is the master plot of the Hebrews' exile from the bondage to the story of freedom. And exile becomes really the uh, that of exile is the figure of the master figure of, uh, of, of the poem. So Dante then therefore is linking now exile and hope. And I think I already have indicated to you that this idea of writing as writing the mode of exile is also that it's not to be seen in a, in a subjective way only relating to him or the, to the precondition for his own poetry but involves the whole of history. History has to be seen from the, the standpoint of, uh, of exile. So there's a, a, a then uh, ex, uh, there is uh, um, at the top of page 366, uh, line 69, hope, I said, uh, again, uh, is a sure expectation of future glory. This is the openness to time as futurity, and it springs from divine grace and precedent merit. The light comes to me from many stars, but the he first distilled it in my heart, who was so sovereign singer of the sovereign Lord David, who to Dante is uh, uh, the greatest uh, of poets. Now, um, so we move on from here now to the last uh, 
the last virtue, uh, the last virtue of uh, of love. Um, the uh, and and it is it, there is a progression: faith, hope, and charity. It is as if only you have to know these virtues before the beatific vision can even be possible to you. You have to you have to understand what it is that they do to you and they produce in you. When we come to love, however, we are we would be looking for a definition of it as at least in uh, in a formula in a in a, in a, in a, in a kind of uh, a citational formula prov uh, given and available in canto 24 and 25 we would be looking for it in vain there's no definition of love and f and it's clear uh, to me it's clear to you i take that uh, that dante really thinks that this is the word the key word love is the key word that seems to escape all possible definitions, which we know around us in a variety of ways. Uh, we understand it, and yet we cannot quite confine it and define it. And that to define it would really literally be a way of uh, reducing its impact and reducing its, its value. It's such a basic word that Dante says that the only word that is really left he, he, he is an imaginary etymologizing in this uh, treatise on language that he writes, this treatise on uh, the De Vulgari Eloquenza. He says that the word love is the only residual term from the past that means that language is a way of, like food, uh, the banquet at the beginning of Canto 24 is a way of gathering us and bringing us together. So love. And food, food is given as a metaphor at the beginning. Now love that escapes any particular definition, and yet it's the culmination of all these theological uh, virtues. What Dante does see, and, uh, and he has, I really want to uh, turn to this scene. Uh, at the end of Canto 26, Dante meets Adam. So it's the confrontation with the beginning, it's the competition with the arch poet, because Adam is the one who names the world and therefore brings it into existence. That's really what we mean by poetry. That's what we're expecting of poets to do. And see, this is the meeting, uh, the encounter with him. Uh, lines 90 and following, Dante addresses him. All fruit, though the, the, the word this is really is apple. Uh, or apple, or fruit that alone was brought forth ripe. What on earth does he mean? That's a strange way of addressing someone. All, all fruit that was al alone was brought forth ripe. There were a lot of theological debates uh, as to um, ripeness is an element of grace, uh, a description of grace for Dante. Uh, uh, if you are not ripe, when you are ripe, when you have received, have been touched by grace. So the argument was, was Adam created in a natural state or was he already created in a state of grace? How long was he in the earthly paradise before he fell? Could, and if he, if, if he was uh, um, in a state of grace, why, could he, why did he fall? Uh, if he was in a state of grace, why could he commit this, uh, this sin of transgression? Is it a transgression that he commits by eating of the fruit of uh, the tree? So Dante implies that he was in a state of grace, ripe, I mean, refers to him as ripeness, as the idea of, uh, of fruit that alone was brought forth right. O ancient father, of whom every bride is daughter and daughter-in-law. This is the very language that Dante will deploy in Paradiso 33 for the prayer to the Virgin and being the daughter of her son. The, the question of uh, the divinity and humanity of Christ. As humbly as I may beseech thee to speak with me, thou seest my wish and to hear thee sooner I do not tell it. Sometimes an animal, let me just skip a few lines and see the answer that uh, Adam will give, line 115, um, and following. Know then, my son, that not the tasting of the tree in itself, 
was the cause of so long exile. So even Adam, the fall, was in a state of exile, exile from the garden, falling into the wilderness, where he had to transform the wilderness into a garden, so that the work would be the way in which he could regain that which he had lost, the garden. But solely the trespass beyond the mark. I'll come back to this. In the place from which the ladies and Virgil, in limbo, I longed for this assembly during 4,302 revolutions of the sun. He's clearly thinking about the harrowing of hell by Christ, so that added now uh, uh, years to, to the 4,000 he counts. In the, uh, and I saw it return to all the lights on its track 930 times while I lived on earth. The tongue I spoke was all extinct before Nimrod. We saw him as the founder of the giant. It's a residue of uh, uh, gigantomachy, the classical idea of the giants fighting the gods. Nimrod who builds uh, the Tower of uh, Babel. So the, the, the debate between them uh, uh, hinges on language. Uh, language is the key now. Uh, and retrospectively, we are really coming to understand the language of theology. The question of what, is the, the, what are the properties of theological language? And what are the properties beyond that of all words? No, that's, that's the argument. Uh, I spoke with Oxley before no Nimrod's race, gave their mind to the unaccomplishable task, the building of the Tower of Babel that would not be finished, for no product, whatever, of reason, uh, since human choice is renewed with the course of heaven, can last forever. It is a work of nature that men should speak. But whether in this way or that nature or that, but whether in this way or that, nature then leaves you to follow your own pleasure. Before I descended to the anguish of hell, the supreme good from whom comes the joy that sways me was named I on earth, E in Italian. Not I in the sense of, you know, the subject. I don't think that that's what Dante meant. Uh, and later he was called El. Dante is using two Hebrew words. Well, he takes them to be Hebrew words for the name of God. God was called E first, and then he was called El. In fact, this is one of my students suggested to me that if you read them backwards, they really spell out the word Eli, uh, which would be a word that we would acknowledge maybe nowadays as being the word for an appeal to God. E, and he was called El. And that is fitting, for the usage of mortals is like a leaf on a branch, which goes on and another comes. On the mountain that rises highest from the sea, I lived pure, then guilty from the first hour to that following the sixth. When the sun changes, quadrant. And that's the end of this encounter. Let me focus on this question of the language that uh, Dante's really with uh, uh, encounter with, uh, with uh, Nimrod uh, explicitly highlights. Uh, Adam changes, Dante is, through Adam is changing the account he had given in the De Vulgari Eloquentia which is a story about the origin of words and language, and where he had claimed that Hebrew uh, persists, the, the Adam's language, unchanged through history, because it was inconceivable, he adds there, that uh, Jesus would be using a language other than the primal language and not the corrupt language of human beings. Now, the story changes. Actually, Adam's language has, has uh, suffered uh, alterations already in the garden where the names of God keep changing. This, I think, is the key. This is the whole question of theology then, the names of God, the way we speak about God. God was called E, and then he was called L. There is no proper name for God. We only have words or languages that keep changing according to our own historical 
circumstances. And Dante was on changing his own paradigmatic account about the status of the sacred language. He says there is no such a thing as a persistent sacred language in history. What comes out is that language is the mark of our own distance from the divine, that we are and the language that we use is a part of our own exilic circumstances and exilic predicament. And therefore, all the language of theology that Dante is, is, has been describing is part of this exilic longing of human beings. This is the story from 24, 25, and 26. Dante uses theology and the examination of theology only to place us back on the world on this world where we go on hoping, believing, uh, and loving, uh, realizing that these are all mysterious terms, without which, however, that's another meaning of the word for of, uh, the resonance of money, without which we, uh, where we know faith as a form of trust, without which we cannot really be functioning together, where we have hope as uh, the uh, realization of faith, and where we have love as that which is we are always longing for, and somehow mis the meaning of which is mysteriously uh, escaping us. These are, I think, the three uh, fundamental issues that Dante is discussing. And uh, let me take some questions. The question is a question that I really welcome, and I was hoping someone would ask. The question is that uh, I did not, I, I read from, I did not uh, really explain uh, the Adam statement uh, when he says uh, that uh, uh, his sin was not in the tasting of the tree, but in the trespassing of the limit, let's say, the mark. Uh, and therefore, it seems that there is some issue of boundaries here. And would I, I care to reply, uh, to give an, uh, try to give a response to that? Uh, yeah, I could give a response at a, at a number of levels, first of all. Um, uh, I would remind you uh, that this is Canto 26 of Paradise. And Canto 26 of Paradise is symmetrically connected with the other two Cantos 26. Uh, the Canto of Ulysses who also trespasses the boundaries, uh, who is a metaphysician of sorts, who, who is dealing with, with space, uh, and who himself does really know oh, where on earth is, he's, he, he's really going. He doesn't know his destination. He's, he's trying to go somewhere, but doesn't really know that. Uh, uh, but they are connected. Uh, and then Canto 26 of uh, Purgatory dealing with, uh, with love. Uh, in, in, its, in, its, in its perverted form uh, of uh, uh, Winitelli, of the poets, right, and Caesar, etc. So that's one of the connections. Another connection is that these are three cantos where Dante is using foreign languages. Um, there's a deliberate connection there the, in the Kant of, uh, of, 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 of uh, 26 of Inferno. You may remember that uh, Virgil goes out of, the, out of the way to speak, be the one who is the interlocutor of Ulysses and supposedly they speak Greek. In Kant 26 of Purgatory, Dante uses the Provencal language of Arnaud Daniel, who uh, Arnaud starts speaking in, uh, in Provencal. And then now we are using, uh, Dante is using a foreign language, uh, uh, Hebrew, uh, the names of God. So it's, uh, that's one connection. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of other, other of these connections. In the case of, uh, of Adam, uh, who makes that distinction, to come specifically to your point, the, who, who makes the distinction between the tasting of the fruit, and it was not that he tasted the fruit, but that he 
trespassed the, the mark. That seems to be, you're right, that was a very uh, controversial subject because indeed that was the, uh, the, the, the command given to Adam. Thou shalt not taste of the fruit of this tree. Uh, and, Dan and, 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 and Dante presents Adam who instead goes out to do that. And, and it's clear that he thinks that the tasting of the tree was not his saying. That, that was not his sin. That's Dante's take on it. It's not the tasting of the tree that was the sin. Uh, the sin was that he uh, ab abolished all boundaries. I, th I read that. I'm restating the, I'm restating the sl changing slightly. So, so I'm giving a paraphrase of uh, what has been, uh, what, what seems to be uh, the issue here. It's, it's clear that Dante thinks that Adam's act of eating of the tree was good. And Adam's act of the eating of the tree was actually the discovery of uh, a knowledge that had, that managed to elevate him. And that was good. So in a, from this point of view, this is a, 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 there seems to be a contrast between Ulysses' form of knowledge and Adam's form of knowledge. Ulysses' form of knowledge is that he literally is, does not go, doesn't even go, know where he is going. That's part of the problem in purely metaphysical terms. You know, he had no, no directions. He, it was a gratuitous quest. In the case of Adam, getting to know of the fruit of the tree was not an issue. In fact, Dante says that maybe real knowledge is always going to be tied to an act of making discoveries and making even transgressions. What was the problem is that there had been a loss of boundaries, that he lost. How are we to understand the loss of boundaries? It was the kind of knowledge that made Adam realize that he could be divine. That was his problem. As soon as you, the, the imposition of the boundary, God's imposition of, or establishment of the boundary between the human and the divine was also a way of letting Adam know, I'm not going to read this as if it were a kind of atheistical statement at all, it's letting Adam know that he had to be aware that he was not a div divine, that he was a human being. What he, Adam, wanted to do was grow in knowledge and discover that he could also be divine. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is the issue. For him to fall then would be a way of reestablishing that boundary and realize that he is a human being and not divine. So it's a growth. It's a growth in self-knowledge. Well, if you really know that you, if you really know who you are, you really have, you have grown. Do you see what I'm saying? Dante is changing the sense of, of what the fall of man is. And the fall of man is not the fall in the growth of knowledge, but that growth of knowledge that leads you to erasing the boundary, to believe that you are, by virtue of that knowledge that you have gained, that you are now divine. And this is, this is really what the whole poem is trying to convey to us is that this is a steady temptation that human beings seem to have uh, and we, kept, we need to be reminded and when we hear it from God himself we don't quite believe it and then we have to grow into that recognition of boundaries between ourselves and something that we aspire to but we are not it yet, okay? Good, good question. But I had anticipated this answer, I must say, uh, in a number of ways, talking about Adam in the past. I hope that you don't remember, because more or less I said the same thing that I don't know that I mentioned before. And one might, uh, one might wonder, just to go back to the, that issue, one might wonder, uh, uh, does Dante really make it clear that he's really not Adam, but he's, he still thinks that he, that he is his Ulysses at this point? W one thing that he understands that he is, in you know, the canto before, he acknowledges King David as the, 
the supreme, and he did earlier, the supreme poet, he's really placing himself in David's Psalms are the lyrical recapitulations of, of, of engrossing of Exodus. Uh, that's really where he now, I think he's trying to move, that he's more, he, he cannot be like Ulysses. He knows he's not, he does not want to be, he cannot be Adam. Uh, that's the kind of model he's trying to regain for himself. Okay, maybe you, you see the connection with what we said a little earlier, uh, with what I, the, exp the response I gave to your question. Yes. I'm just going off of Dante's theological beliefs. Um, in Canto 24, he talks about his belief in the Trinity. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if you could just explain that further, because he seems to be saying both that the Trinity are three separate entities and unity. And I know there was controversy and different factions of different of d different factions in Christianity believe different things about the Trinity. Um, and so I was wondering what Dante believed. Well, uh, Dante has a number of references throughout Paradise to the Trinity. One of them, actually a, a very significant one that we never talked about, was in Canto 25 of Purgatory, where Dante thinks that the way we human beings un understand the tri can understand it, one of the ways in which can, uh, we understand the Trinity is to uh, to think about the, the structure of our mi mind, uh, memory, intelligence and will. You know, there are three but part of one thing and three functions. Or in Canto 24 of Purgatorio that Professor Loomis, uh, I'm sure, uh, explained to you, uh, is that the, if you want to understand, Dante there seems to Im imply when he, he talks about I am one, when he declares his own poetic uh, practice, I'm one who when love in, uh, dictates inside me, uh, go on using my language and so on. One way in which the Trinity was explained, they would say, think about speaking to, to make, it, make it existentially uh, compelling and concrete. When you speak, you have an idea in your mind, otherwise it's babble. You, know? you have an idea in your mind. You emit a sound, but to emit the sound, you need the breath. And you cannot have the sound without the breath, and you cannot have the sound without the idea. So that speaking encompasses this threefold components of one. The Trinity is always connected to one. Then in Canto 10, of uh, paradise. You remember we spent some time there uh, having this idea of the love of the Father and the Son and the breath of love that joins them, they get, go on gazing together. This idea of the fecundity or this idea of the Trinity as source or Dante who thinks about God in the form of, of the mover, uh, but he, 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 he does go into that and yet he understands that that's not the effective theology he wants, to think of God as the prime mover, to think as the, the efficient cause, it, 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 it makes God as such a mechanic uh, uh, or uh, a clockmaker or something, one of these images of, of God who imparts order and recedes from creation. That's really not Dante's idea. He, he wants to think of, of a divinity that is uh, partaking of, 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 of creation's love. Uh, Dante's idea of the Trinity, so he has many, many, uh, he tests all of these paradigms. I don't think that he ever excludes one. Uh, he does not really agree with the reading of Joachim of Flora, who thought that the Trinity was the unity, of, the Trinity would, could be dissolved into three separate beings. So that, that's no longer a unity. To have a unity, you've got to have all three uh, clearly present. That's what Dante believes. A unity with... Uh, a kind of, uh, is it a prismatic unity, let me call it that way. And so that Dante would say, we all have some recognition of the Trinity, whether it's uh, you know, God and the, and the word of God being the Quran from eternally, uh, or God and the word of God being uh, the Christ, or etc. We all have the, the word made flesh. We all have some kind of idea of the Trinity where one acknowledges God as a father or 
a spirit, ways in which we can understand uh, this, this, uh, this thing we call, I don't mean irreverently, we call God. It's, uh, it's, uh, so that's the, that's the response to what you ask. Please. Now, it's very clear. The, uh, the question is, uh, uh, the, the, the earlier question, of course, was about what Dante thinks of the Trinity. Uh, and now the question is, uh, going back to uh, the point of uh, Adam and my suggestion that the, the, the fall is good, um, and though b because uh, ultimately Adam seems to be really wanting to reach God, and I made a contrast to Ulysses, uh, uh, and the, the limitation of Ulysses' quest is that he really does not know. He's driven by curiosity, that's what I meant, um, which we could talk about, uh, uh, this, this uh, evil curiosity. Uh, so, but if, uh, if the movement toward the, uh, toward the good is bad, because after all, Adam does choose to trespass the boundaries, why should that really be thought as, as good? Is that, is, was, that was the question, really, yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, let me just restate this issue. Uh, the problem with Adam, uh, with, I'm sorry, first of all, with Ulysses, I called it now the curiosity, which, as you know, eventually will become good uh, in the Renaissance, scientific curiosity. Uh, that's the good thing. In fact, I have a young colleague who's writing a thesis about curiosity, a book about curiosity. She has written a thesis about curiosity, linking it with uh, uh, women's curiosity. It's a very interesting thesis to say that women are really smarter than men because they, are, they have been attacked for being curious. So she has found Renaissance texts where some written by women who go on making that kind of claim. I think it's a great idea. Uh, but how did Dante understand curiosity? How do the fathers of the church understand curiosity? Why is it bad? Because that is the trait of Adam. Because curiosity has a particular quality about it. It's something that continues this whole understanding, this little curiosity I'm going to give you, well into the 18th century. The curiosity is bad because it uses up. You know, curiosity has a sort of uh, uh, restlessness uh, within it. I am curious of a particular object, I observe it and I move on to something else. I literally consume, I use up a particular object and devalue it in that process. That's really what made it so, uh, so bad. Ulysses who goes from one thing to another and is always open, fascinating figure of the Renaissance spirit of discovery, then, uh, but that's really what uh, undoes this, 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 this uh, element almost of desire, a kind of a figure of, uh, and I don't want to make, I'm not using this uh, uh, to badmouth uh, Ulysses, but a figure of this way of thinking of the curiosity of Ulysses is really the Don Juan, no? Who goes from one woman to another in an endless movement of curiosity, knowledge, that he's driven by knowledge to get to know certain particular uh, situations and, uh, and people. Adam, to go back to the question of Adam, Adam, I'm only giving you Dante's reading. Dante's reading, he distinguishes very carefully between the testing, the tasting of the fruit and the trespassing of the mark. The, the trespassing of the mark meant you cannot really violate the boundaries that I want to st place between you and myself. Because once you get to know 
uh, yourself for what you are. You may get to know me. That's what the part of the violation of boundaries. You may get to know me for what I am. So it's, 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 it's a wall that protects both the essence of the divinity and the specific quality of the human that, that is, uh, is at stake. Um, he, uh, Adam eats, which means that he wants to grow in knowledge. And Dante says, that's not the issue. That was not a problem that I want to grow in knowledge. The consequence of that growth in knowledge was the trespassing, actually it may have very well been the cause, the trespassing of uh, the boundary. Had he really grown, that's really a, 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 an acceptable aim. You have to grow in knowledge. I'm willing to say about Adam exactly the things that you may recall I said about the sin of pride in, when we discussed Canto 10. 11 and 12. It's good that you have this love of excellence and love of the, of the growth of your own mind. The consequence of it, or the, uh, the, the, the flip side of this quest for more knowledge, is the violation of boundaries. And that has to be reestablished. The fall of man is only a reestablishment of the boundaries. It's not a way of mortifying the quest for knowledge. Okay. I'm restating what I, in different terms, slightly different terms, what I said before, but I think that's really a crucial distinction. And I would ask you to try to th think that I, I see a difference between the two, uh, the two situations. I hope you, you will too. I have time for another. No, we don't. Okay. See you next time.